Hello, everyone. My name is Apinan Bosianon, and I'd like to welcome you to our discussion with the curators after the second announcement of Bangkok Art Biennale 2022. Um, Bangkok Art Biennale has been ongoing uh, since 2018. This is our third edition. Uh, our first edition in 2018 was under the theme Beyond Bliss. And in 2020, we had our second uh, edition entitled Escape Roots. And this present edition is called Chaos Calm. Uh, we will be uh, showing Bangkok Art Biennale at various venues all over Bangkok, uh, including heritage sites, uh, temples, art centers, museums, public spaces, and convention centers. Uh, I now like to introduce to you the curatorial team of Bangkok Art Biennale. Uh, Loredana Pazzini Paraziani, Nigel Hurst, Chumwan Wirat Warawit, and Jirat Ratwong Jiragun. Welcome to you all. Uh, these are our working force. Uh, who have been with us uh, over a year. And I think you'll be uh, surprised as well as enticing to hear uh, their views and their experience uh, in Bangkok Art Biennale. So um, maybe i like to begin by talking about the theme itself, because uh, Chaos Calm is... Uh, something that we, in fact, we spend a lot of time in discussion, debate, as well as uh, asking ourselves, uh, before we get to the word chaos calm, uh, we went through many choices, uh, including serendipity, including uh, trepidation, including many, many words and, and many plays and coining of words but we ended up with uh, Chaos Calm, which uh, for Thai people anyway, uh, quite easy to pronounce and quite easy to remember. But the intertwining meaning of Chaos Calm can be multi-layered, uh, whether it be interpreted by uh, Western or even Greek term of chaos, in cosmology, the, the void before the beginning of life, universe, or in other religion or beliefs of chaos, as well as calm, which is uh, something quite opposite. And intentionally, we wanted it to be uh, juxtaposed. But the more we discuss about it, we, we felt that the in-betweens uh, are very, very uh, exciting to discuss. I mean, in between spaces, between chaos and calm. Because in life, uh, life is not cleanly cut or separated. We, we live in constant change and in flux, especially at this time of age of uh, trauma and chaos in terms of politics, climate change, etc. So um, maybe I'd like to open the floor by uh, asking Loredana to begin with of her uh, views, and then uh, we can start from there, please. Thank you, um, Professor Apinan, for your um, introduction. And first of all, I'd like to say that I'm really honored to be uh, part of the curatorial team for uh, the Banco Biennale 2022, which will open this coming October. Um, as as, as um, Professor Apinan has uh, already highlighted, uh, this title draws inspiration from the current times of uncertainty that we live in uh, from an economic and um, political perspective. Let's like just think uh, at the ongoing horrible uh, war in Ukraine that, that um, is going on as we speak, as well as uh, issues of sustainability, um, social well-being. Of course, the pandemic is one. Um, important moment in recent history, environmental disasters, and so on. Indeed, this theme and title, Chaos Calm, opens up a Pandora box of possibilities. 
Um, and also, uh, since uh, Professor Apinan mentioned the various brainstorming that we've done with the title, I would also uh, like to say something about how the title is presented to um, our public, um, how it's written, chaos uh, come with the column uh, that separates the two worlds. Um, in fact, in the curatorial meetings that we had and workshops that we had, uh, to come up with this team and also to present um, the, the, the written version to the public, we've uh, looked at different options. So we looked at not only different words, but also how to write chaos calm. And so we looked at um, the word end in between chaos and calm. We also uh, thought of uh, the using hyphen in between, a colon, a semicolon, and uh, all this syntactical um, alternatives, we realized that an impact on how the um, title was actually going to be understood on the definition of the title itself. So at the end, we settled for the column, uh, Chaos Calm, which we felt was the best perhaps way to um, present uh, the theme, not implying an either or, not implying an alternative, but perhaps implying uh, coexistence with all the nuances that are in between. And um, as you say, chaos calm are two elements that two elements that are part of um, of human uh, history has always been, and I think they will always be. So my um, specific um, personal curatorial interpretation of this title, which is also reflected in the works that I'm doing with the uh, with the artist, uh, take a, a social historical approach um, towards a. a um, um, inclusiveness of history. So, in the works that in the work that I'm doing with the artists uh, together, we look at the turbulent history of Southeast Asia um, and the broader South uh, to consider the legacy of uh, uh, of war, forced migration, social and general marginalization, um, the suppression of main, non mainstream narratives in the face of uh, a colonial uh, history to eventually move forward, embracing hope and transformation. And I think that this is one of the in-betweens you were mentioning. Um, so I think in, 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 in my curatorial approach, this, tran this generative transition uh, between chaos calm is what really um, matters, or what really uh, give way to um, interesting um, uh, conversation. Um, as human beings, perhaps we are more prone to look at chaos and and um, and disruption rather than hope. But um, I, I I try in my curatorial approach to, um, of course, look at the chaos uh, and the past trauma, uh, the ongoing precarity, to then move uh, forward and away from it. So. On the end, we look at the impending catastrophe, maybe that is going to happen uh, or that has happened. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, with the artists that I'm working with, we are also looking at the strength and the incredible endurance that uh, humanity has to overcome chaos. Thank you. So, well, uh, how inter I interpret about chaos. Um, I think I will go to something with very straightforward. Well, when we look at uh, the situation surrounding us right now, no one can explain how chaotic these situations are from the erupting war, ideology dichotomy, immigrant crisis, or even geopolitics to the pandemic that has been living with us for over three years right now. These confusions are effects to the economic index, even ongoing protests that you know, have been happening in many countries, or even the, the unusual rising prices of fuel and food. Even many people have been deemed this, this is the worst crisis in World War II. So chaos, to me, is something that generally express our condition at this moment. And the calm, Calm is, on the other hand, is a word that can be, for me, widely interpreted. It can mean passion, stillness, or even quietness. I, 
I have to say that it is rather challenging, you know, to stay still in this kind of situation. However, as an individual, I think it is more important to question ourselves, how shall we live in such a chaotic world? Or do we need to have strength, courage? What should we do to not sway along with this chaotic situation? So calm in my meanings is to be aware of what is happening, to, to listen to our voices surrounding us, and to make a conscious choice before taking the next step. So we can make sure that we don't make any mistakes by lashing ourselves. And in addition, for me, calm can also mean hope and desire for good things to happen in the day when our hope seem lost because I think hope is something that keeps us alive. This is my interpret about the theme. Thank you. Please do, Jamwan. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. Very happy to have heard the interpretations from my co-curators, because I think this is where we make such an awesome team. The bit in between is really where, I think for a long time, not being a curator or in the art world by training, the area in between that beautiful mix of gray and like murkiness is where I've always kind of um, maybe felt some sort of connection to the area between chaos, calm, which do, do not actually equate to each other as like direct polarities. I think it's so interesting how, you know, at this time, like everywhere you look, everything is divisive, it's polarized. And more and more what we've seen over the last two years is things that sort of keep stretching apart. But when you look at history and you look at like, you know, you could look at it from a positive point of view, the history of trade, you know, our accomplishments as human beings, absolutely 100%. Like at times like this, we focus on like the dire situation that have, you know, like our history, what we do to each other, the exploitation, everything else. But what I think is um, has been really interesting for me to explore also for myself working on this, this thesis, so to speak, is like, what does that gray enable us to, to say, to achieve? Or what, what opportunities can it offer to people whom we don't often see? I mean, they might be very visible, but, you know, in the time, in normal times when we're like, flying everywhere and everything is open. Sometimes those voices are sort of diminished. But I think during these last two years, I mean, don't get me wrong, two years in one place is can be quite difficult. But what we've seen in the last few months is the world is sort of back, right? But what it's kind of, for me, I think it's been really interesting because we've seen different voices come to the fore. We've seen different kind of like issues, agendas, narratives, that for a very long time have always been overwhelmed by a certain singular notion of whether it be development, you know, sophistication, civilization. What we're seeing now is that is no longer the case. And where it's taken me, and I think in the artists that I've been working with, it, is it somehow takes us back to the idea of the land, like a, the land itself, but a conceptual idea of land and like nature, but also in a way where you come from or where you could have come from, could history have been different? And I think it has taken us like that area in between for me also represents in a way imagination and the world that we could build should we choose to talk to each other as opposed to create the division and polarities that we do via geopolitics, economics, you know, everything that my co-curators have mentioned, the state of the world today it's very hard to find hope. Therefore, maybe if we're comfortable in exploring that space in between the colon or, you know, that sort of breath that you take when you say chaos, calm, like what that space can kind of do for us. So that's kind of my interpretation. Thank you. So this is a kind of discussion and debate we've been doing uh, over the years. And you know, when we began, it the, the situation of COVID was, was not like now. So 
as as time evolves, uh, things things have changed, and we we looked at uh, you know scholarly research or writers like Yuval Harari, his uh, Homo Deus, or Bruno Latour, down to earth. All these uh, philosophers have have talked about uh, a lot of issues related to war, poverty, plague, and you know they talk about the past, but the present and the future seems to be like. You know these these three main horrors uh, that threaten human beings uh, seem to to be persistent, and and it is like uh, at the beginning we we were talking about Afghanistan, but now you know as as we evolve, uh, Bangkok Abendale team evolve, suddenly we have another war, uh, Russian Ukraine war. So so all these shifts shifts of not not just paradigms, but sh- shifts of so so many, you know, threatening uh, forces that come to us. Uh, we we have to live this period of selection and looking at the artists as as the world uh, moves along. So so in this way, uh, I think it's it's extremely exciting period to to be working, and we know now that. Things are looking up. Uh, Venice Biennale has opened. Documenta is coming up, but it's not the same. You know, three three blank years have been waiting, and people want want to enjoy themselves in terms of art. But when we look at art, we 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 have to think of other things. And art reminds us of uh, the problems that that we have, even even the the animals we live with. You know, at the beginning we we blame the bats. It's a bat disease. Now we blame the monkeys. You know, monkey pop suddenly pop up. And what else? So all this, all this constant uh, ongoing exterior forces uh, result in our, in our thinking and our selection and obviously the artists. Now, now we come to the artists, the artists who, who are the makers of, of our events and how we curators uh, work with the artists because the artists uh, I think they have you know special antennas special uh, forces to detect and to receive uh, a lot of what's going on and the way they express and the way they they interpret the way they suffer the way they endure these uh, problems we hope very much that uh, uh, the works will come out uh, in, in in our project, and many many artists have, have created new works. So so maybe uh, some of you may share may share some of the artists uh, who you work with or working with uh, in in this project that we are going through. If you okay. Indeed, uh, there has been an evolving situation since the first time we met, we were in the middle of the pandemic and there was uh, uh, no uh, no solution in the horizon. And now uh, that seems to be resolving, but there is a new war, uh, a horrible, uh, unexpected war. So uh, we need to keep up with all these events and uh, the work that I am doing with, uh, with the artists um, that I'm collaborating with for the Biennale is precisely to uh, create points of contact uh, between various artistic practices, uh, between various um, um, research um, um, focuses of the different artists. Uh, And of course, in that, um, while we want to look at a local audience, we also want to cater for an international audience. We want to be relevant to to uh, to those who um, come and see our our Biennale. So um, the the possibility of showing in such a, a uh, an important platform, such a Biennale, such the Bank of Biennale, and um, uh, gives us the opportunity to um, the, for the production of knowledge through these new works or existing works that uh, we've uh, have selected with the artist. Um, I've, um, I'm delighted uh, personally to work with a number of amazing artists. Um, we will share uh, each one of us today, I think, a couple of artists that we that have been announced that we are working with. So uh, within this 
looking at the situation of how the world is at the moment, uh, I'd like to um, share um, the work that I'm developing with um, Vietnamese American artist Tiffany Cho. Um, we know that Tiffany is globally noted for her interdisciplinary and um, uh, um, research uh, based practice. And teams uh, that I've mentioned earlier, such as refugee crisis, migration, displacement, uh, historical and war trauma, are uh, recurrent in her works. Um, in relation to specific geographies, um, primarily. Uh, uh, Vietnam, which is a home uh, land. She has been conducting uh, works uh, on, on, on different um, uh, crises. We mentioned the war on Syria, for instance, um, and working in collaboration with the UNHRC. She's uh, done projects about mobility and, and refugees um, across the world. And, um, and I'm very uh, extremely excited that uh, for Bob Tiffany will focus on this, uh, social political concerns, looking at the heavy burden of trauma, uh, war trauma and loss, uh, learning from the past in the direction of possibly healing and moving towards a better future. So war does not only equate to trauma, but it could also equate to um, 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 healing um, in, 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 in accepting the trauma. Um, Another incredible artist that I have the pleasure to work is Ilan, uh, Ye Ilan, whose work is solidly um, quite um, rooted in Southeast Asia, uh, in Southeast Asian history, while also uh, addressing uh, broader issues of colonialism, power, and the impact of uh, historical memory in, in leading uh, lived experiences. So uh, again, I'm extremely excited to be collaborating with, um, with Dylan, uh, who's uh, in recent year has um, focused on local um, mediums, uh, working with, um, uh, with um, communities, weavers communities in, in her native Sabah. So she works with the Dusun and Murut weavers communities. Um, for a long time, and this collaboration with these communities with local material has given uh, um, life to the Born Your Heart project. So um, it's exciting that for Bob, she will develop further this project and she will incorporate a new narratives to this project to, um, to feature um, uh, uh, outstanding uh, mix media installation. Um, of course, Ilan's look uh, through the lens of colonialism um, resonates with many other artists in the Biennale. One artist that I'm uh, working with at the moment is also uh, an artist from Ethiopia, Wendy Magen Belete, and um, his, his work for, for the Biennale will precisely look on the history and memory of colonialism in, 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 in Ethiopia uh, after World War II. And um, perhaps I'll mention just one more artist just because I'm very excited um, uh, about the possibilities that we are given. Um, uh, collaborating with Jiddish Kolat has been incredibly uh, rewarding. I think of Jiddish as a, a global artist, uh, not in a, in a geographical um, communication, but uh, global in the sense that his concerns are progressively transcending the um, the native India to actually embrace uh, holistically the, the, the notion of the human condition in uh, relation to time, history, and memory. And using abstract and, and um, um, notational languages, um, GT engages with multiple spa spatial dimensions, uh, moving from the, the macroscopic to the telescopic, from the immediate to the cosmic. So for Bab, um, these concerns are also reflected in the works that he will present at the Biennale, uh, which on the one hand reflect on the apocalyptic end of the world, um, a vision indeed of chaos. Uh, on the other hand, it points on a contemplative uh, meaning of life in, in that sense, perhaps um, uh, embracing the idea of calm. Um, and these are just uh, a, a very short mentions of the artists that I'm working with. And, and I look forward to having more conversation with the curators and the artists, because I think it's important to, um, um, to share how all these different artists and practices across all of us come together 
to create really an important um, dialogue uh, with one another. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for me, uh, thank you that I have have been working with. I mean, for John Pinan and everyone that's gave me a chance to working with so many interesting artists. I have been work with uh, Thai artists, Greece artists, or even uh, Italian artists. But uh, for this time, I will speak in detail about two artists that I have selected. Uh, the first, the first one is Pisha Pa. A piece of pie is an artist that's always used her work to criticize systems, politics, and social issues. Her practice used the limit of human body as an individual to question ourselves about our power, rights, and freedoms under the authorities and the government's control, which keep on crushing in and in, creating more and more limits without and decide that it will end. Uh, this work of her is called the standard. The standard is a performance art where Pishapa herself spends her working hour as a company employee in a clear plastic box from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. five days a week. The audience can see the artist doing her work for making conversations with her colleague or even every single of her behavior. Like we are, this is like we are watching a reality show or some dystopian silly and the artist herself have no way out of this circle until the day has end. Uh, for the second artist, I will talk about Alicia Fremis. For Alicia, her work is really contrast to Pisha past work. Uh, why, uh, why Pisha Pa talks about an inescapable dystopia? On the other hand, Alicia chose to talk about hope through her work. This is her work, Leave Here Your Fears. Is a sculpture similar to a donation box in a pyramid shape. Weaver can write down their fears and sorrows on the paper and insert them into the box. This is something like metaphor of throwing away awful things and keeping only what brings joy and ease. You know, it is hard to say that if this act, our act like this is particularly effective or not. But however, I think when we still face crowds of despair and the path ahead of us is still dark, no one knows. So having a glimpse of hope helps us to have the strength to keep walking in this world where chaos never seems to end. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so sharing here some of the artists whom I've been working with for the upcoming show. Um, we've announced Kennedy Yanko. So if you're familiar a little bit with Kennedy's work, what she does is often described, I mean, it's been described as, you know, it's something that really takes up space. And I had the great privilege because I happened to be in New York last year to be able to visit her um, studio in Bushwick. And you have, you know, Kennedy's background, she was a bodybuilder. She was an artist, you know, performance artist, I think went to art school, but then ended up um, working with the Living Theatre as a performance artist and then got into yoga and actually, you know, was a bodybuilder. And then she got into to art, started off with painting, and I think she really found her language in sculpture. And a Kennedy Yanko sculpture is not like a demure, beautiful kind of porcelain thing. It's kind of like large and robust and, and metal. So, you know, Kennedy will, she'll go to junkyards, you know, traveling along the east coast of America and basically stumble upon a junkyard of metal and work with metal guys to take the piece of metal that she wants to work with, goes back to a studio. And of late, 
what Kennedy has been working with, which I find absolutely fascinating, is the marriage of metal, which is still natural, with paint skins. So the paint skin is a very interesting material. It's basically dried acrylic paint that has a sort of viscosity and also like a soft central touch. And so you sort of think that what Kennedy does is sort of duality, but it's not. It functions as like symbiotic merging together of, of form. So I'm super excited to be working with her. Um, also probably worth noting is how in her last show, solo show in Sweden at SF Hill, she um, kind of had a conversation with Hilma F. Clint, like not a real conversation, but we could call it maybe a spiritual or an energetic conversation where F. Klimt maybe um, said, it's okay, let's work together. But on that topic of spirituality, which I think is a really important point of, you know, where we are today and this sort of seeking this other place, this other dimension. And, you know, another artist whom I've been working with is Timor Sishin. And Timor is um, Mongolian Chinese uh, German, lives between New York and Germany and also in Beijing. Uh, and what he does is he works with these, again, monumental sculptures, usually of like of trees or alien formations, always contrasted with technology. And also, you know, what you're seeing in the slide right now is a light box, a light box of of, of sort of this expansive landscape. And where I think he takes you in a way is this question of, you know, where are we in this vastness of time and space? And where is spirituality, mysticism, how does that sit in the realm of consumerism, commercial commercialism, and you know, even geopolitics and identity today? So excited to be showing him. And also um, very excited to be working with Sofia Almeria, uh, Sophia Elmaria, the first time I came across her work was at the Tate Britain with Beast Type Song, a commission by the Tate Britain, an incredible video um, that kind of suggests perhaps an alternative point of view or even alternative history. Sophia is often kind of seen as if, if there was a genre, it would be called golf futurism. So imagine what the Gulf would be if it weren't for the history that it experienced. So you're maybe looking at a little bit of um, metaverse creation in a way, like what are the alternative narratives and how, and what I think is so interesting is like, it's not just you're looking at the alternative narrative. She has a way to be able to take you right into her work and through her use of, I think, music, time, and just overall direction to, to pull you into a space where you think, wow, this could be, you know, in another place. And I think that's very much the case with the work that she's showing at the Venice Biennale in the Salle d'Armi. It's um, a work which was co-commissioned by the Victorian Albert Museum. And its starting point is Tipu's tiger. So, you know, the sculpture of the colonial soldier being mauled by a tiger and what that represents. So, you know, again, decolonization comes up. And um, the last artist I wanted to speak about quickly, just because her work is so stunning, stunning is Nengi Omuku. Nengi is from Nigeria. She is a painter. But what is so fascinating with what she does is she doesn't paint on canvas. She paints on a material, a traditional Nigerian material called soyon. Soyon is a natural fiber, often worn as like um, loincloth sarongs or even as sort of like head wraps. And it has a unique sort of spine structure to it. And what Nengi is interested in as well is this idea of, you know, going back to the land, making space and building communities on the ground with, in a way, your own people, getting in touch with your very own narratives and histories, which maybe there wasn't an opportunity to do before. So that's it. Thank you. I just like to add, uh few artists that might interest the, the audience. Uh, we, we will be having uh, new works uh, by Anthony Gormley, uh, placed in the temple of the Reclining Buddha. So that would be quite exciting because it will be uh, site-specific work where uh, Gormley has, has designed uh, sculptures yeah, quite specifically on the side of the uh, lawns at the temple. 
of reclining Buddha. Also, we have a uh, new large scale red textile works by Shiaru Shiota. Uh, that's going to be quite amazing. Uh, but for, for Thai, Thai artists, uh, we have Pinari Sampitak. Uh, she will have a, a series of her previous works, uh, large installations related to, to breasts. Um, also, Kavita Watanat Tiangun, she will be doing a uh, sort of Kavitaj, uh, which she becomes a uh, sort of uh, a more version of herself. Uh, her works be related to issues of uh, pollution and and isolation, and we have, we've also commissioned a uh, new film by Jagawan Nintamrong, who's going to be uh, making a new film related to uh, the situation of the post-apocalyptic world where uh, the survivors float on the raft in in the river as well as the group collectives uh, Sadhu Padu. Uh, there'll be a collection of uh, women artists uh, from the three provinces down south, uh, Bataniyala and Naratiwa. They'll be making a lot of uh, textile works, uh, installations, videos. So these are some of the, the, the artists uh, we'll be showing. So these are kind of the kinds of mix that we have, uh, very renowned uh, artists as well as emerging uh, artists mixed together. So we hope very much that uh, you, you'll be able to enjoy uh, our Bangkok Art Biennale, which will open officially on the 22nd of October uh, this year and runs until 23rd of February, 2023. Just to wrap up, uh, maybe we ask our curator of the team to, to comment a few words uh, on their experience in, in working in the team of uh, Bangkok Art Biennale. So please. I might say that this is an incredibly uh, enriching experience. Um, and in a way, what um, Tom Wan also said, this is where also different uh, curators, mm -hmm. different perspectives come together. So one uh, very rewarding um, experience in all this is actually having this type of conversation, sharing and learning amongst us. And uh, uh, we, we, we all, I think, are... Um, not only supported but encouraged by this conversation to do more, to do further, to develop our ideas. I mean, we find great um, communication and, and, and way of, of um, mm. testing new grounds, trying to do new things with the journal. And this is another thing that I find uh, very exciting, uh, that we can be creative because it's, it's a new journal, although there, has been, there have been three years this is the third edition. There have been two editions already. Um, the structure of the Biennale itself is very exciting because there are, uh, as we know, many venues. And some of them are challenging, like, uh, of course, the temples, like uh, Professor Abinan just mentioned, uh, Gomli. One of these, I have also uh, one artist that is um, a feature in the temple. And I find this very exciting because it stimulates ideas of how to... Um, have uh, history meeting, uh, you know, contemporary art. And in a way, this defines a new topography of the city uh, of Bangkok, which is not, um, it, it is not uh, marked by landmarks, uh, you know, for the buildings, but actually uh, by the contemporary art that is scattered to, to, through the city. Um, and, I, and I think that's very uh, exciting possibility. And, uh, and, uh, and then lastly, I would like to say that, um, uh, you know, it's an ambitious project uh, because we want to keep all coherent. We aim, we strive to keep coherence. Uh, we've had many dis conversation discussion on this in terms of the quality of the work, the presentations of the work, um, the theme in relation to the theme. Um, because eventually our idea is that to have a Biennale that is very distinctive, that has a very clear identity, and, uh, and we would like to have this identity well represented in all uh, the venues. I can speak for myself. My, my aim is really to um, resonate to a wider public while um, be very um, relevant to the place and the region we live in, to the history and the people of Southeast Asia. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, uh, for me, my experience working as a PAP curator, uh, I think I would talk about this, this thing, which is for me is quite interesting. Uh, I would consider working as a bad curator is something very new dimension to my work. I, I would say that I did think Professor Pinan Willis choosing a gallerist to be a curator for BAPT is rather challenging, honestly. But uh, from my experience as a gallery for more than 10 years, so I think I still met people confused between these two words, between galleries and uh, curator. Some even use this job instead of each other. So however, in, in reality, I think these two jobs have a stark contrast in their purpose. So once I have been selected for this position, I would have to share my working myself. But uh, nonetheless, even though the perspective of the curator or even the galleries are different, I think these two jobs are still based on the same principle, which is to create and offer something like new possibility to working with the artist. So I think this is what I want to share. Thank you. Um, my experience working as a BAP curator has been really interesting because as I had mentioned before, I am not a curator by trade by any means, but my role in the art world, whether it's here or anywhere else, has always been on the fringe or in the periphery. And I think it's really exciting to be part of a Biennale, which is in its third edition, where the ecosystem around it, I mean, the contemporary art ecosystem in Bangkok, in Thailand, you know, in a way it's, it's, it's still taking shape, it's still taking form. And in so many ways, there's lots of things we might kind of like, um, when I wasn't part of this, you kind of, you know, you sort of complain about, you kind of think, well, there should be more support. But the thing is, what I realized being part of this team is that what we're doing, there's, there's definitely camaraderie. There's definitely a sense of kind of understanding of what you need to do to make something happen because the infrastructure is not always there to support you. But I think it's super unique because BAP kind of makes it happen. Like some of the projects that I'm working on, you will see they could be deemed impossible projects, but yet they happen. And I think that pragmatism is really interesting. I think it still exists here in this city. And part of it is because it's yet to be defined and being part of something when you're usually not part of anything at all, working towards defining something which really is an alternative. It has to be because the system in which we work, you know, we had our first governor's election in nine years, just last month, right? So what that means is infrastructurally speaking, structurally speaking, we have to create in a way our own way of being able to make art production happen, make exhibition happen. And I think what I've learned with you know, what I've been able to do with, you know, Adana, uh, Professor Pinan's kind of support also is to be able to look beyond the ecosystem of the art world directly and explore how more partnerships can be made. Because at the end of the day, what is a Biennale for if it's not for our immediate community, i.e. the city of Bangkok for Thailand and also for everyone else who now that they can come visit, come visit. So I think it's really important you know, and it's been really cool to be able to identify some of these stakeholders who typically wouldn't be part of this, who, you know, six years in, you realize maybe you don't have to explain anymore what a Biennale is, right? Because we're like third edition in and I just feel, yeah, really grateful and um, hopeful with it all, actually. Thank you. If I may add one thing, I think this precisely this fact that we are very heterogeneous, uh, the four of us, um, uh, Nigel, uh, and the three of us here in, in Bangkok, together with Professor Apinan, I think that makes it quite uh, unique because we look at things in different angles, but eventually out of our conversation, I think we find a way to progress and to really make things happen. And that's very exciting um, for us, for, for the immediate um, you know, audience that we have around. So thank you. Thank you. So um, I think 
I think each time we we invite, I don't call it select, we invite the curators to to be on the team. Uh, it's it's so exciting because you you don't know what to expect, and the the chemical reaction uh, from day one to to now it's like halfway uh, has been incredible, and and each 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 time is different, and I think there's a good rapport, uh, good working partnership. Uh, I wish we should fight more, uh, so that <laughs> more excitement and chaos. <laughs> But it seems that uh, things have, have gone, you know, we, we respect each other's space and opinions. And of course, there are a lot of uh, debate, discussion, disagreements, but uh, it's on the table whereby we, we help resolve the obstacles together. And like all of you said, um, to have Niger in London um, and to have uh, you guys here, uh, I, th I think I think it's been it's been challenging, uh, but thanks to Zoom, thanks to the new ways of communication, uh, we managed to put across a lot of messages to to, to the people, the stakeholders, and I think uh, not not only in in Bangkok but within the region of Southeast Asia or, or Asia Pacific. Uh, I think. Bangkok Biennale or BAP is, is, is now being known, recognized, and, and people enjoy come to see it. Uh, and even if they can't, we have uh, everything on digital, online, we have virtual walkthroughs. So we try very much to, to support the system, the old ecosystem in, in, in Thailand, in Bangkok, in the art world, it's not, you know, by any means complete. But in fact, it's, it's probably good because it's incomplete. It's, it's like warped a little bit. That's why we, we create, we become creative and we have to uh, get it by, you know, ways and means. And of course, the, the finance, the support, the sponsorship is incredibly important. And a lot of the support, especially from the corporates, uh, not so much from the government, the corporates have been really good, very helpful. And I think uh, this ongoing project, you know, after the third edition, we, we hope very much to, to continue uh, so that, you know, young, young artists can grow up, students can, can learn more. And the experience, the opportunity for, for especially young students, artists to, to see, uh, you know, amazing works, major works come and show in Bangkok instead of having to go to Venice or go to Kassel or go to Guangzhou or Yokohama, but have it here whereby uh, it's you know, at the doorstep. So in this way, I think it's a learning experience and, and it's, it's a, a growing path that I think we, we can all appreciate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 See you October. See you in October. See you soon. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm Nigel Hurst, Director of Exhibitions at IMG, based in London. Um, I think BAB 22 Chaos and Calm promises to provide much to ponder um, about where we are now and how we might respond to the challenges of the time when societies across the world grasp the urgent need um, to reevaluate our relationship with each other, our immediate environment and the planet as a whole. However, um, there's the ever increasing danger that these challenges will be undermined by uh, the geopolitical upheaval that's grown rapidly um, in recent months that none of us can ignore. Um, we can no longer take for granted the relative stability of world order preceding the pandemic that led to decades of relatively sustained economic growth for many of the world's regions. Nor can we assume, I think, a united approach to climate change in the face of cost of living crises worldwide. So I think chaos certainly is apposite. Um, at the last curator's announcement, we we touched on whether now might be the time for developed countries to learn long overdue lessons from 
um, the world's longest continuing indigenous cultures as guides to how we all learn to live if humankind um, is, is to survive. Um, generations Y and Z in particular seem to be re-evaluating the quality of their lives based on shared experience, whether uh, in real life or, or in the metaverse, rather than by what they might own, which calls into question the future um, of uh, a global market based um, on consumerism, uh, which includes the way that market functions uh, longer term and, and the art market within that. Um, so, but many of the artists in, in BAB22 whose work might seem uh, chaotic and reflect uh, this, this world environment, um, and, and also, you know, the, the fact that some of their work is, is, is quite anarchic and open to random chance, use quite control methodologies and collaborations which underpin their practice and obviously have to go about that in a calm and reflective manner. Uh, others practices form from um, indigenous community itself. Um, by way of example, um, Jake and Dinos Chapman's work uses meticulous model making techniques and skill draftsmanship to create quite quite complex and, and uh, iconoclastic dioramas, sculptures, prints and installations uh, that examine contemporary politics, religion uh, and, and, and morality. Um, they, they first gained recognition as, as enfant terrible, I suppose, of the YBAs in the UK in the 1990s. Um, from their etchings of Goyeresque mutilation to, to, to Hieronymus Bosch-like modelled um, landscapes in, in, in vitrines featuring legions uh, of barbarous zombie Nazis and, and Ronald McDonald's, um, the Chapman brothers explore, you know, that the very polar and chaotic nature of horror and humour, uh, pain and beauty, the perverse and the sublime, um, the diabolical and the, the infantile, using wit and purity um, in, in equal measure uh, to entertain, shock uh, and generally confront viewers um, with their, their own voyeurism, possible double standards and, and complicity um, in, in, in the state of the world. Um, recently, um, this jaundiced approach has grown into what Jake Chapman recently described as a seething disdain for, for each other. Um, and the two brothers are, are no longer um, working together as we speak. Uh, and one of the pieces um, uh, in the in the Bangkok Biennale it is just made by um, Jake Chapman alone. Uh, another artist that um, will be in BAB 22 uh, that I've had the opportunity to invite is Rachel Nebo, who has spent many years learning ceramic production techniques to carefully control the results of chance um, and accident. She's a contemporary British artist whose complex porcelain sculptures comprise organic forms that, that in some way unravel the human experience in figurative sculptures that are often, often quite erotically charged, yet also um, odd and, and dysmorphic. Um, Kneebone strives to represent the human body in all its complexity. Um, she's concerned with what it means to inhabit a body, um, its physical limitations and possibilities. Inspired by themes of transformation and renewal, Kneebone's complex sculptures seem, seem born from, from quite intense emotions. Um, she visibly exploits the material properties of porcelain uh, and allows her work to rupture and crack, uh, prompting the viewer to contemplate relationship between strength and vulnerability. She expresses movement, chaos, chance, fluidity and vitality in a medium usually associated uh, with, with stillness uh, and calm. Um, based in the northwest of South Australia, uh, in contrast, the APY Art Centre Collective is a group of 10 Indigenous owned and governed enterprises. They work with a united vision and voice for collaborative community-based artistic projects while providing strategic business support and infrastructure for each other. 
This includes creating and exploring new markets, increasing artist and art centre income and supporting business development and innovative, collaborative regional, national and international projects. From the beginning of the APY art movement, these artists have embraced the opportunity to celebrate and share what's known as the Chukapur or cultural stories and law through large scale paintings. Senior women artists as community leaders have expressed that it's only through these major works that first Australian communities enjoy the ultimate freedom of expression and exploration and depiction of their chukapa, once again, cultural stories and law, and also their ungura stories of the land. Uh, APY artists are renowned for producing works of significant scale including regional collaboratives that have produced pieces that are recognised as masterpieces and have been acquired by leading museums uh, in, and institutions in Australia and abroad. So these are just three examples um, of the artists and collectives that I've had the opportunity to invite to take part in the Bangkok Biennale in 2022 and, and more will be announced shortly. Um, uh, it only remains for me to say that you know I had the really good fortune to be one of the advisors to the inaugural Bangkok Art Biennale in 2018 and I'm delighted to be part of BAB22's curatorial team. I only wish that I could have been there um, for the, the conversation. Um, I'd have rather done that than, than this, this monologue. Um, I think the BAB Bangkok Art Biennale in 2022 continues to provide a really important and exciting platform for artists from Thailand to show their work alongside international artists. The last couple of years um, have been really tough for everybody and have acted, I think, as a reminder of the vital importance of shared human experience um, through global and cultural collaboration. I think now more than ever, um, it's crucial that we build and maintain international dialogue that builds bridges through art and culture.